From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. In a recent conversation with Doug Tallamy about ecologically minded fall cleanup, he raised the name of Heather Holm and how some of the pollinator research she's been part of lately is informing how he shifts his approach to garden maintenance this time of year and again in spring. I wanted to hear more, so Heather's here today to talk about how we can each support pollinators in our gardens beyond the season of bloom in the off-season, too. But first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Heather Holm is the award-winning author of the 2017 book Bees and before that of Pollinators of Native Plants. Her expertise includes the interactions between native bees and native flora, and the bees' natural history and biology. I'm so glad she's here today to tune us into their needs. Hi, Heather. How are you? Hi, Margaret. Thanks for inviting me. Yes. Um, so before we get started, I'll say that because I enjoy your books and use them so much that we'll have a book giveaway. And actually, I want to give away a copy of each one of them. So with the transcript over on awaytogarden.com from this show, we'll do that. And then, <laughs> as I said in the introduction, in that conversation about fall cleanup with Doug Tallamy, um, it dawned on me that as much as I know and as many experts as I've spoken to over the years about pollinator plants and pollinator gardens, I don't know as much at all about how a bee's life history really works and what is a, what's a bee's eye view of my place other than the flowers. And I wondered if you could kind of introduce us a little bit. I know there's many different species of native bees, but sort of generally speaking, clue us into how a bee sees a place like our gardens. Sure. Yeah, as you said, the big the big take home message is just bee diversity, right? So thirty thirty seven hundred species approximately in the US and each has um basically each is overwintering in a different life stage than another. Um so it really makes it challenging in our gardens if we're trying to supply supplemental nesting sites, for example, I always get the question, well, when do the bees leave? <laughs> and and it always goes back to, well, it depends on the kind of bee. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing to, for people to remember is, you know, of those 3,700 species, about 90% have a solitary lifestyle. So they really have this narrow window of time during the growing season that they're active as adults. So we have you know, bees that are the first bees to come out in the spring and are active for four weeks, maybe in uh, April or May, depending on where you live. Um, but then on the other hand, we have a social bees such as our bump, native bumblebees, and they will be active throughout the growing season and have very different strategies for overwintering. Mm-hmm. So I can c- continue, but <laughs> yeah. so bumble- bumblebees... Well, so- yeah, yeah go that's ahead. a good one. Bumblebees, I think, is a good a good uh, group or whatever to kind of um, start with them and give us some examples of, you know, their what are they looking for, or what do they see as a good place, you know, et cetera. And again, beyond the flowers, right? I mean, right, long beyond long beyond the flowers. The flowers, uh, particularly for bumblebees, the the fall blooming plants are critical because what's happening in the fall is the new queens produced in a bumblebee colony are coming out and they're practicing foraging. And while they're visiting flowers to consume nectar, they're, they're building up fat stores, which will help them for their winter hibernation. So most people are unaware that bumblebees are annual uh, colonies. And unlike um, the European honeybee, which, you know, can survive the winter and the colony can be perennial. At the end of the growing season, no matter where you live, the, all the bumblebees will perish, uh, except for those those new queens that are preparing to hibernate. So they're they're hibernating as adults, um, 
and they go off and disperse from where they grew up uh, in the nest where their mothers raised them and they're looking for a really nice insulated place to spend the winter so that can be a number of different situations in a garden it, it could be that they tuck themselves into a abandoned rodent hole. They may find um, a mouse nest. Often they, they're attracted to mouse nests. Um, in, in, I live in the upper Midwest, so we have very cold winters. So they're really looking for you know, an insulated place. But if you're further south, they may tuck themselves just under a heavy pile of leaf litter. Uh, some hibernating queens will, people will find in their, in their compost piles. Right. But the key is, you know, a place that's providing some insulation. So when you said that um, the the lifespan, this this queen um, who's going to make the next generation, she she came out. Bees have a, these native bees have a full metamorphosis, and they have there was an egg and a larvae. I mean, can can you tell me take go back in her life a little bit? Or forward to her sure. next generation, yeah, yeah. So the so those new queens are called gynes, and they um, are produced at the end of the growing season. They overwinter as adults, and as you just said, they are the the new queens of next year's colonies. So they're the, the queens. Bumblebee queens live the longest of any of our native bees because they are alive for twelve months or twelve or thirteen months. Um, so they're doing that initial winter hibernation as an adult, and then the following spring, uh, depending on light and other phenological cues, they emerge from their uh, hibernation site and then establish their own colony. But they will perish at the end of that growing season, but produce uh, new queens. So it's um, it's a pretty precarious lifestyle, even though it's social and um, they you know, they have to survive the winter. They have to build up enough energy and fat stores to do so. They, you know, may be impacted by certain practices that we're doing in our garden. We, you know, we may be raking up a queen bumblebee tucked away for the winter and putting it in bags, uh, leaf bags. So, yes. so that's sort of the precarious part. And the other piece is uh, having adequate food supplies, especially in early spring when they emerge. Uh, because their energies are depleted, they need calories in order to, to to start that nest initiation process. Right, right. And in the early spring, I'll see them at the most at the earliest blooming flowers. Um, and I always, in my head, in my very overly simplistic, <laughs> almost not understanding at all. But all I knew was she's she's hungry so to speak but also she's going to provision a nest so that's is that right she's so she's eating for herself and also collecting material to provision a nest is that right right yeah. correct yep yep she's yeah. got to find uh, an adequate supply of pollen producing plants because she's going to create a large pollen ball to where she'll lay her on multiple eggs mm -hmm. so uh plants such as willow and really early Spring blooming plants are critical for bumblebees um, because they need that pollen supply. Nectar, nectar is their carbohydrate source, their fuel. Right. <laughs> they do combine a little bit of nectar in with the pollen stores, but pollen's the critical piece for raising offspring. Mm. And so, if we were to pick another type of native bee to contrast uh, against the bumblebee, which you said is the longest, the queen is the longest lived of our native bees. Uh, the queen bumblebee. Um, there are some that are just uh, that their adult life is what a few weeks or right. Yeah. So the the ninety percent that have this solitary lifestyle, it's just a single female that's uh, you know emerging from her nest where she was raised and living maybe four to six weeks, and she's doing all the uh, nest construction and nest provisioning tasks herself. And so it's a very narrow window of time. And native bees, um, the males have a much shorter lifespan than females. They're, they're basically their sole purpose in the bee life cycle is to mate with a female. Mm -hmm. uh, but the females live a little bit longer because they're doing that nest provisioning. If we take that back to uh, our gardens and, and maintenance, the, the ones that typically can be impacted by our maintenance practices are the the 30% of native bees that nest above ground. And they oh, would okay. be um, 
you know, building nests in cavities such as holes in wood, uh, plant stems, uh, supplemental nests that some, some folks will put out. So anything, if we're doing any clearing or cutting down or, you know, removal of materials such as that could be cavity nesting sites, then they would be directly impacted. Okay, so if I want to do the best job I can understanding that there's many kinds of bees with different needs, some are cavity nesters, some uh, under some insulation on the ground or in the ground, like you mentioned, I think an old um, animal hole or something like that. Uh, some nest in stems above the ground too, right? I mean, aren't there stem nesting bees as well? Yes, yep. So stems can mean... Um... A number of different things. Uh, some some of our smaller cavity nesting bees, like pith-filled flower stalks, so uh, pl plants in the aster family, for example, are ideal nesting sites for those smaller stem nesting bees. Um, uh, similarly, some of our woody plants that are more softer wood, elderberry, sumac, they, ought, they will have pith-filled centers or hollow centers. Oh. And the bees will mine out that, that styrofoam-like pith in the center and to excavate a nesting cavity. So it really it depends on the, the bee and where they preferentially nest. Because you can imagine it nesting in an old flower stalk, uh, the orientation of those stalks is near vertical, the way it's and bloomed on top of those stalks. Whereas if they are nesting in a hole in a standing tree, uh, those bees would preferentially like more horizontal nesting orientation. And then the other key thing is the, the size of the opening. So small bees will seek out very small diameter cavities, depending if it's in a hole in wood or a plant stem. And then the larger bees will be looking for larger cavities. Huh. So... So here we are, it's fall cleanup, and this is why Doug mentioned, because we were talking about that, he mentioned your work, and you've been participating in some recent research, and you had some ahas that even he seemed, they seemed to even inform a different um, way of cleanup in the fall with something like the stem nesting bees and some of these others in mind. Can you tell us a little bit about that research and kind of what's the new news from it? Sure. The So... So for those stem nesters in particular, the ones that are in flower stalks, for many years I've been telling people, um, you know, not to do any really fall maintenance or cleanup. And, and then in the spring to cut down the flower stalks and leave the flower stalk stubble. And that is what the bees would occupy for that nesting season. Going back to bee life cycles, we're talking about these solitary bees that nest in stems or cavities, their egg to adult time frame is 12 months if they're producing one generation per year, which is typical. Um, so if the, the confusion with gardening and, and maintenance, uh, maintenance and cleanup is um, if you leave the stem stubble as nesting opportunities, uh, you have to leave it indefinitely. People often, people will ask me, well, then when can I remove it? <laughs> <laughs> and so part of the messaging is we, we need to get beyond um, this cleanup mentality, right? Uh, I find in my garden, um, I, I let the leaf litter fall. I leave everything up for the winter. And in early spring, I cut back old flower stalks to provide new nesting opportunities. But I let all that plant debris just fall to the ground. And that the leaf litter combined with plant debris is really my my weed barrier or my mulch alternative. So mm -hmm. it's um, it has a couple of advantages for bees. It it's a it's looser material. Um, the bees that are ground nesting can easily crawl underneath it to excavate their nest below ground, um, and you you don't have to purchase mulch. And mulch now is becoming a vector for things such as jumping worms. So I think people are thinking a little bit differently about using a lot of mulch in their gardens. Right. Importing stuff, so to speak. Right. Right. Um, so, okay. So, you know, a lot of gardeners are listening and they're thinking, okay, now, wait a minute. 
what can I do that's still going to feel gardeny, but is looser and so forth. And so, you know, I, 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 and people who've listened regularly to the show know this, you know, I sort of started out as a million years ago as a sort of collector garden kind of person, you know, with all these, many of them non-native plants and, you know, more sort of designy kind of gardens and so forth of unusual things. And then I got tuned in maybe 20 something years ago to native, native things and birds and insects and so forth and more all the time. And so I still kept a couple beds around the house that are more of that old designy stuff. And, and I've added looser areas farther out, so to speak, big areas that I practice more what you're talking about now. And, you know, sort of other ways when you talk to gardeners, how do you help them compromise or learn? Do, do you know what I mean? It's, it's tricky. Like, it is tricky. I think you've got the perfect balance, right? If you have too much leaf litter for your more formalized or structured gardens, you can always transfer that to your more naturalized gardens. Right. Um, and it really depends on uh, the contrast between uh, square footage of gardens and, and lawn and so on for each particular gardener. Um, you know, my, my yard is two thirds of an acre and my lawn is 30 feet by 15 feet. So it's very, very small. Uh -huh. So for me to tra to move the leaves off the lawn and into the uh, surrounding natural habitat, isn't a big deal, but for some folks that have the opposite dynamic, uh, mostly lawn and a little bit of garden, then yes, you you would be inundated with uh, the quantity of leaf litter and wondering right. what what do I do with all of this and so on. Right, right. I I I haven't, you know, and really my solution, and that's definitely in quotes, um, has been more to um, identify areas which are getting larger all the time by the way that I am managing more loosely and to uh, you know tip the balance reduce the lawn obviously um, areas around trees um, that were once mulch are no longer mulch they're living mulch you know things like that to loosen up right. in general um, the way that things are maintained um, so if so so sol we're talking about, you know, solitary bees and social and so forth. Um, the solitary bees, are those the ones that when people buy or make those bee houses, is that what they're, who they're trying to attract? What, what are those about? I'm, I'm, you know, with the little pieces of like bamboo or whatever, the hollow stem right. kind of yep. things. Yeah. Those, those would be su supplying supplemental nesting sites for the, the cavity nesting bees. Um, that that uh, the bee houses have become rather commercialized. So yes. I tend to not recommend people use them, um, partly because some of them are really poorly designed. They're very shallow. So you can imagine uh, what's happening inside a cavity nest for a solitary bee is she's building multiple little rooms or cells uh, and each cell is partitioned with some kind of natural material. So they're lined up cell after cell after cell with a wall or partition in between. And so if you have a very shallow cavity and shallow, but I mean by, you know, two to three inches is shallow, then she's only able to really have maybe three to six larval cells developing inside that cavity. Generally, there's bees have predators like most other natural organisms. Yes. So, uh, you know, the first three or four uh, larvae developing inside of that cavity could be predated upon by woodpeckers or parasitoids or you name it. So that that's not a great situation if the the design is poor, that you want to have longer cavities so that they can ensure that the ones at least at the back of the cavity will survive, survive to adulthood. Um, the other piece and why I don't encourage people to put these up is they do require maintenance and cleaning and replacement of stems. So uh, many people have great intentions. It's much like putting up a, a nest box for birds yes. and, uh, you know, probably only 10% or 15% of folks would actually do the regular cleaning out of the nest box and maintaining it and so on. So that's what I worry about with the supplemental bee nests and and that's one reason why I'm trying to encourage people to think well what what are 
what are the natural ways that these above ground bees nest? Um, putting a, putting logs in your garden if if you're able to, if you live in suburbia or where somewhere that's uh, appropriate, that's a great way to provide nesting habitat. Um, leaving a standing dead tree if you have a larger property or having the tree removal company leave 10 feet of the trunk as a snag. Yes. Uh, that's great habitat for a number of things besides bees, birds, for example. Um, so there, you just have to think a little bit about the, the natural ways. And the easy one that I mentioned earlier is the stem stubble. That's something any gardener can do. And that provides a nice uh, array of nesting opportunities. And the difference between that and the supplemental bee hotels is the bee hotels are tightly aggreg aggregated uh, nest one next to the other. And that's not how these solitary bees nest. They nest in a cavity here, a cavity there. They're not, um, you know, nesting right next to their, their another species or so what happens with the bee hotels is there's a higher propensity for disease transmission too right so those are some reasons why I shy away from uh, recommending them now there are folks that do a really great job of uh, maintenance and cleaning and stem replacement and so on and that's 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 great um, they're also uh, a very useful tool for teaching people about native bees at nature centers or something like that. But for the general homeowner that's busy and uh, doing a ton of different things, uh, I would shy away from putting them up. So it reminds me so much of what you said, like the bird houses and so forth, you know, where people are like, well, I put up, you know, bluebird houses or whatever, but then it turns out it wasn't really, it was like a pretty cute house, fancy, designy, but it wasn't really designed with the species in mind and it wasn't maintained right and so on and so forth. So, yeah. So, yep, that's yeah, exactly yeah, it. Yep. yeah, yeah. So, so in the last few minutes, I wanted to hear uh, one thing, especially the stem stubble you've mentioned a couple of times. So, okay. So I'm not going to cut back in the fall. Okay. Let's say I have like a meadowish planting or a, um, or just even a bed of perennials. I'm not going to cut it back in the fall. And then comes spring and I'm going to do what? Like how high and what? Just describe it a little more specifically to me. Yeah, so the, um, the, the, so you're out there in spring. You want to be careful not to tromp around on, in any of your gardens too early in the spring for all those other insects overwintering under the leaf litter. Yes. Um, but if you have what I do, if I have a place to stand and cut the plant stems from, um, you know, a sidewalk or a, a lawn, mm -hmm. you can start with those fairly early, cut down the, the old flower stalks. And the, the length that you want to leave is anywhere between eight and 20 inches. So we, the research has found that bees will nest in a variety of cavity, um, lengths. Uh, I generally just, I'm using garden scissors, so my I chop <laughs> and yes. just try and eyeball uh, at least more than 12, usually 15 inches of stubble. Okay. Yeah. And you don't have to do it for all plants, but this is a great opportunity for a gardener to, well, take a look at the stem. Is it hollow? Is it sturdy? I mentioned earlier plants in the aster family they tend to have very, you know, goldenrods, asters, black-eyed Susan, coneflowers, and so on. They tend to have very fibrous, sturdy stems that will yes. last for another 12 months for as a nesting cavity. Uh, something like a daylily would is too soft and wouldn't be appropriate. So concentrate on what you think are more fibrous and sturdy stalks. Um, take a look if the stalks are hollow or have a pith-filled center. Both are fine. Uh, you know, native bees aren't that big. Even those larger ones I mentioned earlier that may nest in larger diameters, you don't want to leave any hollow stems bigger than um, no no bigger than a half inch diameter. So okay. the mason bees and leaf cutter bees like three eighths of an inch diameter. So okay. if we go to those really big tall plants such as Joe pie weed that yes. have hollow stems. You don't want to leave the, you know, if the stems edging on to three three quarters of an inch in diameter, that's not going to help native bees. Okay. Discerning discerning by looking while you're cutting. <laughs> what, 
what would be an experiment. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, Heather, there's a million more lessons that I need to learn, but your books, both of them, which we're going to have, as I said, the giveaway with the transcript of the show, uh, of both books are so helpful, such great guides. And I appreciate your taking the time today to talk. And I hope we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Margaret. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. And thanks to all of you for listening to Now Don't Miss an Episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook and Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.